thank you very much for um, inviting me. And uh, uh, Seamus, thanks again for sharing your, uh, your story and being uh, dinner uh, company uh, last night. Um, so I'm a geriatrician. Uh, I work as a, a clinician at a memory clinic. I also do uh, research. Uh, my research is mostly on um, cerebral autoregulation, brain perfusion, blood pressure, uh, and causes of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, I will not be talking about that. I will talking about, uh, be talking about my clinical work, uh, mostly. Uh, but our research is embedded with uh, the neuroscience department of the, the Donder Center and the, uh, the Rudbout Alzheimer Center. Uh, and a nice picture of some... Uh, <laughs> this is what I think most of you will probably associate with, uh, with my home country. What I'll be talking about, I will start out with giving a brief overview of, um, of how memory clinics are organized in the Netherlands. Um, uh, I'll try to do that quickly so we can make lunch in time. Uh, then I'll talk a bit on research that we did on to see how memory clinics perform. And what we did is look at whether memory clinics outperform uh, GPs in the follow-up care of uh, dementia patients. Um, then I'll end up uh, with some work that we did on our own memory clinic. I'll just tell you how we work and uh, a little bit of research that we've done there. And I'll, uh, it will include work on biomarkers, actually, so that nicely follows. Um, but first, uh, as already was discussed by, uh, by Brian, uh, we just um, launched the Delta Plan, uh, Demen C, Delta Plan Demen C in, in Dutch. Uh, the Delta Plan refers to the, the 1950s when we had a storm flood in the Netherlands and a lot of uh, uh, people died in the, the province of Zeeland which is below sea level, and they, they constructed the Delta Plan uh, as to strengthen the dikes against the storm flood, which is actually the metaphor that is being used by the people that, um, that devised the Delta Plan. Uh, I'm not always sure if I really like this metaphor, but it says we have to protect uh, the Netherlands against the, the storm flood of, uh, of people with dementia. Um, anyway, that's, that's the, the term they chose, and the good news is that we will get about 200 million uh, euros in uh, funding, and it has to come partly from government, but also partly from the, uh, from the industry. And the, uh, the plan focuses a lot on uh, finding the cause uh, of Alzheimer's disease, which uh, I guess is good, but if you look at the, um, the media response, uh, which is interesting, a bit surprising, but good to realize, I think, to know what lives in our society. Um, it was quite negative. Uh, we were being accused, well, we, uh, the, I wasn't in the Delta plan, but uh, there were accusations of the, uh, the Alzheimer mafia, of that um, uh, we're exaggerating the number of Alzheimer patients just to get funds for research. Um, they were uh, criticizing the involvement of industry, and they said, well, industry is just there to make profits out of Alzheimer patients, and um, uh, that's not where the money should go. And then they linked it to, uh, to Souvenate. Uh, there were some, uh, some pretty harsh attacks on, uh, on the Souvenate, the, the medical food that's being used against Alzheimer's, and how the, the, the architect of the Delta Plan uh, has done lots of research on Souvenate. So this was a big negative response, which surprised a lot of us. Uh, but I guess the most fundamental criticism was that all the money in the Delta Plan was going to research to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. And people were saying, well, what about care? What about the patients who are here now? They need care, and uh, we need money for that. And I think that's, that's a good point to keep in mind. Um, uh, so what I'll be talking about today will well, be, be about that, about how the care is organized at this moment in the Netherlands. Um, for my overview of how things are organized, uh, I've used data from uh, Frans Verheij, uh, who is in the uh, memory clinic in uh, Limburg. Uh, and Frans is a old age psychiatrist. So, in uh, 1986, there were two memory clinics in the Netherlands, so not that much. Um, you would think, well, uh, what were they? They were university hospitals. Uh, so, where did other people with dementia go? They mostly went to psychiatry services, community mental health services, uh, psychiatric ambulatory care. So there was places where these people could go, but there weren't memory clinics. Uh, a small increase in 1998, some more distribution. Um, but if you looked at what 
kind of patients memory clinics saw. They were younger, if you compare them to the patients who would go to community mental health centers. Uh, higher educated, more worried well, so that's people who think they have uh, memory disorders but don't really have it. Uh, more MCI, uh, which was just around that time being uh, conceived actually as a con concept. Uh, more rare cases of dementia and, and funny enough, a, a larger variety of psychiatric diagnosis, which would probably include diagnoses like burnout and um, personality disorders, etc. So even more variety than in the uh, mental health services, actually. Uh, so how do we know all this? Uh, Frans Verheij leads a, um, the, the memory clinic monitor, where there is a questionnaire sent out to all memory clinics that we know of in the Netherlands. Uh, and these consisted of the same questions and that they were repeated in 1998, 2004, and 2009. And from 2009, the mental health services that are not strictly memory clinics were also included. So I'll show you some of those data. Um, uh, in 1998, still most of the memory clinics, there were 12 at that time, were research oriented. Um, they didn't really collaborate. They didn't offer any psychosocial interventions. And most of the patients were referred back to the GP directly. Um, and if you look at all patients with cognitive disorders, uh, those memory clinics saw less than 5% of all those patients. Um, you can see uh, a graph with the um, overview of the, the growth of memory clinics. Uh, you can see an inclination point. Um, do I have a... No. The point, there it is. <laughs> the inclination point here. Uh, anyone have any idea what happened in 1998, 1999? To spur? Any clue? Cholinesterase inhibitors? Um, so that's not a coincidence, and actually the, the, the companies that produce the cholinesterase inhibitors uh, encouraged the uh, development of memory clinics, helped setting, uh, setting them up. Of course, also the awareness that there is a drug also uh, motivated people, uh, patients, but also GPs to refer people to memory clinics. But, um, and this is the distribution in uh, graphically. So you can see there is more memory clinics, but there are also more nicely, evenly distributed. So that means that most people in the Netherlands have access to a memory clinic, relatively short distance. Um, who coordinates them? Uh, well, good news, mostly geriatricians, um, which I think is good, um, but also neurologists, psychiatrists, um, uh, mixed the multidisciplinary teams, um, and the other is, uh, is a rest group. Uh, why that is, is mostly it's cultural. There are some countries where psychiatrists do the dementia care, other countries it's the neurologists. Uh, in our country it, it's more the geriatricians. Um, I think geriatricians are, are well suited because we do a little bit psychiatry, we do uh, uh, well, see, the routine medical care, but also uh, are more uh, sensitive to social uh, needs and functional uh, needs, so that should work well. Um, if you look at the community mental health teams, so who are not officially memory clinics, uh, a lot of them are coordinated by a nurse and much smaller by a geriatrician and a few are run by a psychologist. Um, this is a bit uh, a blurry slide, I'm afraid, but if you look at uh, who's working in all these memory clinics, you can see that it's, uh, um, for example, some, uh, what would you expect, geriatricians, neurologists, uh, dementia nurse, but also uh, occupational therapists, uh, neuropsychologists, uh, uh, and just a very few, few, unfortunately, speech therapists, but they're growing. Uh, we have one. Uh, where do the referrals come from? Uh, in 80% of cases, that's still the GP, and then there is a mix of, of others, but the majority of people who see a memory clinic come from their GP. Uh, waiting lists, uh, you can see that here, relatively short, so most people are seen within three to four weeks. Uh, and then the time to diagnosis, it's not much longer, so it's actually uh, a lot of people from referral to diagnosis have to wait less than four weeks, which I think is, is good. And once you start worrying about whether or not you have dementia and you start the process, it might be nice to uh, have it over with soon and not be uncertain for two more months. Um, the 
initially there wasn't much cooperation. You had the memory clinics, you had the community mental health services. They didn't cooperate. But as you see, uh, over the years, uh, this, uh, this increased, which would, for example, mean that if we diagnose a patient with dementia, but they already also have uh, behavioral problems or depression, uh, we refer them to a uh, psychiatry. And vice versa, if the community mental health services have somebody with depression but suspect that they may have a cognitive disorder, they refer them to us. Um, here you can see the, the growth between 1998 and 2009. Um, memory clinics went up from 12 to 40. They see uh, currently about 270 patients on average per year. 58% have dementia. Um, that leads to a total of about 10,000 people with dementia that are being seen at present. And we estimate that that's about 44% of all patients there really are. Of course, we don't know how many there are, but that's what we estimate from population studies. So you see that the coverage uh, is growing. It used to be less than 6% 6, 6 of patients who were seen. Uh, goes up to 44. But also means that more than half uh, have never been seen by a uh, memory clinic. Uh, what do we see? Well, it's, it used to be mostly dementia, less MCI, less subjective cognitive complaints. You can see that it changes in 2009 uh, that was more MCI and more subjective complaints. Uh, in, in 2009 we had the comparison with the community mental health services. You can see that it's, well, it's, it's comparable I think with what memory clinics see. And this is already three years ago. I know it's suspect that the number of MCI and subjective complaints has gone up since um, what do we diagnose there? Well, as you would expect, majority is Alzheimer's disease followed by mixed, so that's not really exciting news. Um, we've asked, do you use standardized criteria? Um, and what you can see, well, most say, well, yes, we do it for dementia and for AD and for vascular dementia, uh, but the numbers go down really fast for Lewy bodies and FTD. Um, and even here, I mean, you can, Imagine that people say, well, we use it, but if they really use it when they diagnose a patient, uh, I doubt it because I, we had to do it for a study recently, and I always think I follow the, the uh, NEN CDS ADRDA criteria for AD, but when I used the checklist, uh, I sometimes found myself making a diagnosis that wasn't really compliant with these criteria. Um, so I, I doubt that people really use it that often, but they know of it more, I think, and they don't even know about the other criteria. Uh, what kind of diagnostics are available in these memory clinics? Um, uh, you see that if you look at uh, 1998 to 2009, um, you see, well, laboratory investigations, neuropsychological screening, uh, imaging, uh, ECG, a full sorry, neuropsychological evaluation um, that was all present. The, the full, actually, uh, so that it would involve a neuropsychologist, only in half, actually. EEG is much more rare, but it grew, and CSF wasn't very much available uh, in 2004. We don't know about 1998, but probably not. Uh, and availability has increased. Um, but do people use it? That's another thing. And how often? Um, well, if it's there, uh, so let's say full neuropsychological screening in about 60%. If it's available, it's being used in about 90% of cases. And the same goes, for example, for um, imaging. Lots of availability and being used in about 80%. Uh, for CSF, for example, availability doesn't mean that it's being used. People can do it, but they only do it in about 10%. And if you look at um, what community medical mental health services use, um, it's, uh, there's less availability of the more somatic uh, things like uh, EEG and CT. Uh, the memory clinics were asked, how often do you think that your MRI uh, changes the diagnosis? And I'll come back to that uh, for data we have on my, my own memory clinic. Um, we can't really see it anymore, <laughs> but uh, just to tell you, the most think that it uh, changes the diagnosis in 20 to uh, 
30%, about here, and between 30 and 40%, that's the majority. There is very few that think it's a bit more, um, but uh, this small fraction thinks it changes the diagnosis in about 70%. So the majority of people think it does change the diagnosis, but well, anywhere between in 50 and 20% of, of patients. Um, uh, same goes for the, the CSF. Um, how often does that change the diagnosis? A very small fraction thinks it changes the diagnosis in 60 to 80 percent of patients, um, but the majority are somewhere between zero and 40 percent. Um, what's available in our memory clinics? Um, well, pharmacotherapy, which is not surprising because that inspired some of these clinics. Fortunately, also advice and support. Uh, psychosocial interventions, uh, not that much, uh, which is a pity because they're much needed, I think. Occupational therapy is growing, um, in part because we did some studies that showed effectiveness of uh, occupational therapy. Um, so it's grown and then it's plateaued, I think, at 20%. Um, this is not treatment, of course, but that's <laughs> uh, back to the GP, let's say happens a lot in about 50%. Uh, pharmacotherapy, quite a lot, uh, and I'm uh, surprised at the 30% uh, the of combination therapy, which is actually off-label. I thought it was only in the United States that people would get cholinesterase inhibitors and uh, memantine, but even in the Netherlands, it, um, it happens quite a lot. Um, but on our end, you could see, well, this is... Um, corresponds to the fraction of Alzheimer patients. So you would think that this would be almost 100% coverage, almost all patients with Alzheimer's disease would get treatment. Uh, do we do research? Um, well, it's going down. The, the initial memory clinics used to be all about research. It's dropped down to about 40%, which is still not too bad, I think. Uh, they participate in drug trials, which sometimes can be more like seeding trials. Uh, it's not really research. Uh, but fortunately also research into uh, neuropsychology evaluations uh, and the effects of psychological treatment. One example is, is our own center which did a uh, MCI support group uh, and evaluated the, the effect of that. And there are some hardcore centers that do biomarker research. We are one of them actually. <laughs> And what is ongoing work um, is quality indicators, which are, of course, hard needed. Uh, when is a memory clinic good and which memory clinics are not good? But that's politically sensitive and it's, that's why it takes so much work. Uh, so that's a brief overview of uh, how we are organized in the Netherlands. Uh, we move on to the research that we've done. Uh, and the question we were asking is, once you've made a diagnosis at your memory clinic, um, is it better for the patient to be followed up by that memory clinic or can you refer them back to the GP? And one of the thoughts behind it was that the GPs um, have little or less experience with uh, Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia uh, and that patients might be better off in a specialized memory clinic. Um, so we coordinated it and Els Mavesen um, uh, did a study, I think she will get her PhD hopefully this year. Um, uh, and it was, uh, the results were published in, uh, in the BMJ, uh, and it, I think, answers a bit the question that Richard Smith uh, asked in his, uh, one of his blogs. Uh, it's worth reading, by the way, uh, what, what use are memory clinics? Um, what we did is um, look at effectiveness of follow-up care, so it's not initial diagnosis. Um, we randomized patients to, uh, after their diagnosis, to stay with us or to be referred back to the GP. And we followed them up 12 months post-diagnosis. And the study ran between 2007 and 2009. There were nine memory clinics uh, that participated. The study included 86 uh, memory clinic patients. So MC means uh, people who stayed with, with the memory clinics for follow-up. 88 went back to the GP. 60% uh, of patients were female. There were 78 years. 60% had Alzheimer's, 10% had vascular dementia, and the rest is mixed. It says in the paper mixed other, but actually other diagnoses were very rare. It was mostly Alzheimer's and vascular dementia or mixed. Uh, CDR of one, that was the majority of patients. 
there was some dropout, and the dropout was slightly larger in um, the people who went back to the GP. That was either because the patient didn't want to continue or the caregiver. The primary outcome um, to determine, well, uh, which one of us is doing best, the memory clinic or the GP, it's difficult to measure what is good. So what we did is we measured the quality of life for, of the patient and the sense of competence for the caregiver. Um, and there were lots of secondary outcomes, really a lot of ratings and, and people were complaining about filling out all those forms. Uh, but the secondary ones were mostly about um, uh, the neuropsychological inventory, so behavior uh, ratings for the caregiver to rate their anxiety levels and depression levels. Um, but the bottom line of the study was that after 12 months, there were no significant differences in outcome. That means that uh, patients uh, and caregivers uh, at the memory clinic and GP uh, did just uh, as good or just as bad. Um, there are a few caveats of this uh, study. Um, there was one exclusion criteria, that is that um, if uh, either the, the patient or the doctors at the memory clinic had the idea that specific memory clinic care was deemed needed, uh, they would exclude the, the patients. Uh, so one of the effects was that lots of the uh, more rare diagnoses like posterior cortical atrophy or FTD, uh, Lewy body disease, uh, would stay w with the memory clinic. Um, and what went to, into the study was mostly the, the mainstream uh, patients. Um, and also, um, so let's say that the really rare cases where you could say, well, that would be a really challenge for the GP, uh, didn't go into the study. Uh, and there is also a selection because the GPs don't readily prescribe cholinesterase inhibitors. So, uh, the patients that were really interested in getting these uh, also dropped out of the study. So we do get a bit of a, um, a bias, um, and the bias tends to favor um, uh, equal performance, because we, in the study you select patients for whom you think, well, um, you don't uh, at forehand think they will be worse off uh, being followed up by the GP. Uh, but even with that in mind, I think it's an important study that shows that um, uh, even though the, the memory clinic had lots more expertise and daily routine with, with uh, managing uh, dementia care, uh, the GP actually does quite well. Um, so that uh, could be very cost effective to at least send those patients for whom you think, well, I, I don't really see why the GP wouldn't uh, be able to do this. Send them back to the GP um, and they will not be worse off for that. Okay, and then the final part. Just before lunch, uh, I zoom in on uh, my own memory clinic. This is the Nijmegen City Center. This is the Radboud University. Um, we are part of the Radboud Alzheimer Center, which is a research center that combines well, um, uh, preclinical research, biomarker research, animal research, and, and human research. And that goes from uh, psychosocial interventions to, um, uh, to uh, uh, drug interventions, for example. How we work is that uh, we do an intake uh, on one day, it's a half day, it's either a morning or an afternoon. Uh, we take history, we take a separate history from the proxy, um, and we do a physical exam, of course, um, ECG and lab. And for the lab, we take the really routine uh, internal medicine uh, standards. We, we skipped doing vitamin B12, folic acid, and vitamin D because they, um, there is no evidence that it uh, carries any benefit, and it's costly. Uh, we do a screening test, and I'll show you a bit more about that, and a cognitive test battery. And then we have a uh, multidisciplinary meeting right after that, so that's before any uh, other diagnosis. Uh, so at this first memory clinic meeting, we say, well, based on our history and physical exam and uh, cognitive screening, uh, what do we think this is? We put that diagnosis on, um, and then we discuss, do we need any other diagnosis, any diagnostics like MRI, like CSF, like neuropsychological evaluation? And if we do, we get those tests, and we have a second meeting, and we look at whether we have to change the diagnosis or confirm it. Uh, and then we do follow-up. Follow-up can be uh, based on, do patients want uh, uh, medical care? Do they want uh, cholinesterase inhibitors, etc.?
Um, this is, of course, the screening you all know, MMSE, CAMCOG, uh, clock drawing test. Um, we use other screening tests uh, for uh, depression, balance, uh, gait speed, etc. So we get a comprehensive idea of this, how this patient works. Uh, our cognitive test battery is, is quite good. It's a small neuropsychological evaluation. We use the 15-word test, uh, the Ray Auditory Verbal Learning Test, which tests uh, working memory, episodic memory, encoding, uh, but also language. Uh, this is how we should perform. Uh, so there's five repetitions of 15 words. It's a tough test. Uh, but people should show this learning curve. Um, and after this, we, 20 minutes later, we asked them which words they remember. And then we showed them a list of 15 uh, words that were included and 15 new words, and they have to pick uh, which words they recognize. Now this is, um, I think Seamus would agree, this is not a nice test. This is very uh, demanding and, and uh, people don't like it because uh, if you only get to four words, you feel that you're doing a really poor job. Uh, but it is very sensitive, uh, as I will show. We do the trail making test, uh, A and B, which is mostly a psychomotor test. Um, connect the dots between uh, one and A and two and B. Um, and we do a uh, digit span test. Um, so based on these, um, uh, which is, we do it backwards and forwards. Um, so the forward part is already difficult, but then you have to remember this list, turn it around in your head and repeat it. That's also uh, confronting. Um, my experience now is that the MMSE and, and CAMCOG are really very useless, um, unless people have advanced dementia. Otherwise, it's, it's a waste of time, uh, because they, they tend to be normal, or like MMSE scores of 24. Um, CAMCOG scores above cutoff in people who really have dementia. Uh, they're only of use, I think, sometimes if people, for example, have a language disorder and you can't really trust the 15 words test and you can see whether they were able to remember the, the pictures. Um, I think the, uh, the 15 words test is not a nice test, but it's very sensitive to, um, uh, especially to early Alzheimer's disease, people with um, high education who tend to compensate. Uh, but even the 15 word sets will, will get them. Um, and the trail making I think is useful, uh, especially in uh, uh, vascular dementia. And it may also be one that predicts uh, driving ability. So what do we see? This is uh, the last two years. We saw 750 new patients. In 250, we had a final diagnosis at day one, so no further diagnostics. In 500, we did uh, something else. So, and in 350 cases, that was MRI. Uh, in 230, that was a full neuropsychological evaluation. And CSF in 70, so that's about 10% of the whole, which is uh, not that much. Um, mean age 74, a lot of our patients range between 30 and 100. That's because our neurologists don't have a memory clinic. So we also get the young patients. Uh, um, most of them have Alzheimer's, uh, a lot of them have MCI, but also quite a bit who do not have dementia. They have burnout, uh, problems in their relationship, which is a common cause, I think, of, of memory complaints in the, in the elderly. Um, what comes out, if, if, you, um, if the initial diagnosis is we suspect MCI or dementia, then about 80% uh, uh, get additional tests. If we think they don't, or they have depression, uh, that number drops to about 40%. Um, if you look at the group we initially diagnosed with either MCI or dementia, and you compare the ones who get uh, MRI or CSF, neuropsychological evaluation, with those who don't, uh, the ones who, who do get it are younger, um, and they are functionally better, uh, which means that, uh, that's my interpretation, that if somebody is older or functionally impaired, uh, we are more certain of the diagnosis and don't need, uh, don't ask for the, uh, the other diagnostics. Um, if you look at CSF, um, the, um, who gets CSF analysis and who doesn't, uh, the ones who get it are younger um, and have slightly higher education, are more likely to be a second opinion. Uh, so again, I think these are the ones where we need more 
certainty of our diagnosis. Um, and then this is a difficult slide, but I'll, I'll help you to it. It's, I think it's interesting because it, it works the same, by the way, for MRI. It shows you what our initial diagnosis was, so at day one, and how it changed uh, when we had the follow-up diagnosis. Um, and I've specified CSF, uh, but the same goes for the MRI and uh, neuropsychological evaluation. You can see that if we initially thought of AD, uh, that diagnosis remained uh, the same in about 92% uh, and 88%. So these are people who got MRI and neuropsychological evaluation but without CSF. And these usually got everything including CSF. You see that actually it doesn't really change that much. Um, so you would see that you could safely conclude that doing CSF and MRI in AD, uh, if your initial clinical diagnosis is AD, doesn't really do much. Uh, of course, we don't have gold standard comparisons, but um, I, I would argue that this is the diagnosis they go home with. So for the next four or five years, uh, the final diagnosis they get will be their diagnosis. Um, it changes more. Uh, um, you see that some patients initially diagnosed with AD uh, turned to have no dementia which is, of course, very essential, but the CSF didn't play any part in it. Um, so we do have uh, some diagnoses that are being overturned, but it's less than 10% of, uh, of work. Um, the same goes if the, um, uh, for example, the initial diagnosis is MCI, um, uh, then about 50% are retained. So there is much more change in, um, in MCI patients. Uh, and the same goes for if we think of other dementias like Lewy body, FTD, um, those uh, uh, other tests like MRI, like CSF, have more impact. Um, but you see that the difference between uh, what CSF adds to MRI or um, neuropsychological evaluation is quite small. Um, but the success rates of the initial AD diagnosis are not met. So you could say that for anything other than AD, so if you think of MCI or more rare diagnosis, um, doing those MRI and neuropsychological evaluation might be uh, useful, at least it has impact on the diagnosis. Uh, uh, and the same goes here for the ones that we initially thought had nothing, like no uh, dementia, no MCI, uh, about 30% uh, moved up to MCI, but you see here there is some, uh, some more impact on, uh, of CSF biomarkers. Um, Okay, so in conclusion, I think um, uh, the, the biomarkers that we use in, in, in clinic um, can be of use, especially if you're uncertain, uh, if you have second opinions, if you have really young patients, uh, if you have uh, rare diagnosis, but if you have a clear clinical AD patient, they're not much use at all. Uh, and that even goes for, uh, for CSF analysis, but they do add uh, confidence uh, but whether that is cost effective uh, is difficult to say. Um, and I think it, it's interesting for the CSF, you can also read uh, PET amyloid imaging because they're sort of a mirror reflection of each other. Uh, so the question is how much uh, amyloid imaging will really help us in, in clinical diagnosis because it's mostly used for Alzheimer's disease. I, I doubt that it has any use there. It will be of interest for research but it will not really change your, um, your diagnosis in dementia stage, but it may have impact in um, mild cognitive impairment stage or in differential uh, diagnosis. So I would like to um, keep it at it and um, let's quickly go to lunch, I would say. <laughs>